Welcome to part three of our module five. We're going to be talking about improving memory and learning today. This is obviously going to be very closely connected with what we talked about in the last video. We were looking at forgetting and memory construction. And really what we're going to see here is we know there's all these different ways that we forget or reasons that we forget. So to improve our memory, we're going to kind of um, use different uh, skills or different um, tactics to kind of address those different points and try and you know fix these little holes that we have when it comes to forgetting and when it comes to memory. So the first things we're going to talk about all have to do with improving our memory through encoding. So basically we're going to encode the information better to begin with and that's going to help us then remember it better later on. So the first way we can do this is what is called chunking. Chunking is very straightforward. It's something you probably use all the time. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to increase the amount of information that we can hold in our short term memory or our working memory at one time by combining them or grouping them into chunks, right? Grouping them into pieces of information, chunks of information that are connected. Now we can do this different ways. Um, a really simple way that we do this is by uh, holding words in our heads instead of just individual letters. So instead of trying to remember all of the individual letters in the word, you just remember the whole word as a whole. Um, we can also do this with numbers, right, by putting them into groups as opposed to just having one big number line. So for example, um, if I gave you this number here, 4408675309, and I told you to remember it, one of the best things you could do is chunk that into different pieces. So for example, we could chunk that number into 440-867-5309. Now you probably notice the way we say that and the way we say phone numbers is always similar, right? Whenever someone reads you a phone number or leaves you their phone number on a voicemail or something like that, it's always with that same rhythm. What they're really doing there is they're chunking it. And by chunking it, it makes it much easier to remember. It's much easier to remember three digits, three digits, and then four digits, or even sometimes two and two, right, than it is to remember all these numbers at once, right, all seven of them at one time. So we use that chunking to help us remember. In addition, we can also use what is called maintenance rehearsal. Maintenance rehearsal is another thing that you probably use all the time. All it is is repeating the information over and over and over again to try and lengthen or prolong how long we hold it in our short-term memory. Now again, both of these methods have to do with encoding. We're trying to get the information into our brain, but we're just doing it in a way that's hopefully a little bit better than just you know hearing it one time or reading it one time or seeing one time. So with maintenance rehearsal, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna repeat it over and over and over and over again. And what we're really doing is we're lengthening how long it can sit in that short-term memory. Now, this isn't necessarily still gonna work for you know forever. Um, it really just makes it last for about 30 seconds. So it's not like this is going to be useful for us remembering something for, you know, a few days or whatever, but it's really good for quick things that we just need to remember for a short amount of time. So for example, uh, maybe if you need to, you know, use a calculator and then you need to put something in on your phone, right? Or you need to get a phone number off your phone, but then using it in a different app, right? You might say it over and over again in your head as you switch from one to the other and then try and enter it in. Same thing, right? You see this example on the slide here. Uh, if you have a few items you need from the grocery store, you might just repeat them over and over again. So if I need bread, milk, eggs, paper towels, and ice cream, I'm just going to say it again and again, right? Bread, milk, eggs, paper towel, ice cream, bread, milk, eggs, paper towel, ice cream, bread, milk, eggs, paper towel, ice cream. And I'm just going to do that again and again and again, and eventually it's going to kind of stick in there a little bit. Now again, um, a week later, a day later, probably not going to be there still but for shorter chunks of time, it is useful. The last way we can really improve our encoding is through the use of mnemonics. And this is actually going to be the best way um, and the way that is going to be the most useful for kind of like long-term memory. Um, and, and really the most useful also for you guys as students, unless you're trying to remember um, like algorithms or equations for math or science, uh, but at least in this class and most of your other social studies classes, these mnemonics are going to be much more useful for you. So what a mnemonic is, is a memory aid that we use to encode information. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can do this. Um, but the best ones are using vivid imagery and organizational devices. 
vivid imagery, organizational devices. So we've actually already used a few of these in class this year for AP Psych. So one of the ones that I introduced you pretty early in the year is right here on the slide, which is this SODAS, right? This is a mnemonic right here, an example of a mnemonic device. So what we're doing is we're taking, you know, five pieces of information and we're basically kind of putting them together in a way that one has imagery, right? A literal soda. You can think of a literal soda when you think of sodas, but it's also holding that information for you, right? Space, order, define, apply a scenario and synonyms. This is actually an example of what is called the PEG word system, which is this very first one here, which is a mnemonic technique for memorizing lists. An object or image is visualized with holds or pegs the information that needs to be recalled and makes it easier to remember. So again, we have this object, our soda, and that pegs this information. Because when I think about soda, right, I can think of spacing, order, define, apply scenario to scenario. This one has synonyms. I use sentences instead of synonyms, but the same basic idea here. Okay, it's pegging that information there. We've also used um, this peg word system a little bit uh, when I gave you guys the mnemonic PDF for the biology unit, where the uh, PhD went through and created all those different um, mnemonic devices. So the one that I always remember is the um, the octopus, the occipital octopus, and um, it's that octopus, and instead of having suckers all over, he's got eyeballs everywhere, and I remember, because occipital octopus, right, those things kind of combine, they rhyme, you can connect those two together, and because he's covered in eyeballs, I always remember that, okay, he's covered in eyeballs, and that's because the occipital lobe has to do with vision, with sight. So again, it's just another example of that peg word system. We also have what is called the method of uh, loci, I believe it is. And what this is, is basically where we're going to take a, uh, a physical place that we are very familiar with. So for a lot of people, it's like your house. So the place you're very familiar with. And what you're going to do is you're going to associate these different words or numbers or, or objects or whatever it is that I'm trying to remember with literal physical spaces in that place I'm imagining. So for example here, um, if I want to use my house, which is probably one that's really good, if I close my eyes and imagine myself walking into my house in the front door and I turn to the left, I know exactly where everything is, right? I can look and I can see the kitchen table, I can see the fish tank, I can see the kitchen to my right, and I can picture where all those things are. The way I would use the method of Loki, uh, or loci, sorry, is basically I would place whatever I'm trying to remember around that house. So around the different things. Now, um, if I wanted to get like really good with really useful with this, what I would do and what we see in like the memory Olympics and um, with memory competitors is we're going to see them mix those things. So for example, let's say uh, I'm trying to remember, um, let's say I'm trying to remember a, a poem, right? Or I'm trying to remember um, a chapter in a book or I'm trying to remember a speech I need to give. What I might do is I might create some sort of visual representation of all of the different things I want to say. So it can be key points, it could be key terms that I need to use, it could be key statistics, it could be um, every line of what I'm going to say right in my speech, however I want to do it, but I'm going to create an image that represents each one. So if for some reason I'm talking about psychology and I need to remember to talk about the parts of the brain, maybe I would have you know one uh, object, one image for each part of the brain. And they're going to be really vivid and really dramatic. So I could use like, for example, the octopus we talked about, the occipital octopus we talked about before. Now I could combine that with the method of loci where I'm going to basically put those things together. So now what I'm going to do is as I'm giving my speech, um, when I'm, I'm thinking about walking through my house as I do that. And so as I walk through my house, I'm going to remember that I put that octopus with all of the eyeballs on his limbs, I put that in the fish tank. And so as I'm walking through the house, when I look at that fish tank, I see the octopus, I see the eyeballs on it, and I remember the occipital load has to do with the vision, and then I can get through that part of my speech. And that's really how mnemonic devices work, and they're very, very, very useful. We do use them uh, very simply in things like this. A lot of times we use them to remember um, like the planets um, and their order, things like that. We use mnemonic devices to do those. 
Now, another way that we can look at encoding and increasing our ability to encode information has to do with how we actually do the practicing or do the encoding. So um, this comes from Herman Ebbinghaus. We talked about him before when we were looking at the forgetting curve. And one of the things he discovered was that cramming is actually a really poor way for us to remember things. Um, and now the unfortunate thing is this is how most of us study, right? Most of you, when you have a test coming up, you probably sit down the night before and you spend, you know, an hour, two hours, three hours, some of you maybe four hours, where you're just studying that information constantly. Um, this is what is called masked practice. You can see that term at the top there, masked practice. Again, we're cramming the memorization of information or learning into one session, and usually one extended session. Now, what he's found is that if we actually uh, use what is called distributed practice, we're much more effective. All distributed practice is, is spacing out the studying of material um, by including breaks during those study times. Now, you can do that a bunch of different ways. Um, the most effective way is to, you know, study for small chunks of time over a very extended period of time, right? So if you think about AP psychology, if you wanted to, you know, have the best possible study plan, maybe you study for 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes every day for the entire school year. Right, that would be the best kind of plan of action. Now, in addition, though, we can also do it even when we don't have a ton of time, but by breaking up our studying during that day. So let's say I have a test tomorrow and I want to do some extra studying. You'd actually be get more out of your studying if you study for like 20 or 30 minutes and then take a 10 or 15 minute break and then study for 20 or 30 minutes and then take a 10 or 15 minute break than you would if you just study straight through the whole time. Um, we're going to see why that is in just a second. The other piece I want to mention, though, is that that break is like a literal break where you're not doing anything. It's not like a um, I studied for 20 minutes and then I watched 10 minutes of TV or something like that because our brain is still doing things when we watch TV or when we just are you know, playing games or listening to music or whatever. So it's like a literal break of I'm just kind of like doing nothing. I'm just laying around um, relaxing for a little bit and then I go back to it. We actually will learn better and remember more because of how we're encoding that information. Now, the reason for that is actually connected to retrieval. So as well as, you know, in, increasing or uh, getting better at encoding our information, we can do things to help with the retrieval. So the serial position effect is a really important piece and it actually is connected with why um, and now I'm blanking on the word, distributed practice is more useful as opposed to uh, massed practice. So the serial position effect is our tendency to recall best the first and the last items in a list. Now, this is obviously done you know, in a, using literal lists, uh, but it's the same kind of idea as if you're studying, right? You can think of the beginning of when you start studying and the end of when you start studying, or the beginning of class and the end of class and then the middle. So this right here um, is the, you know, the graph that from the experiment that he did, where basically he had a list um, of words, you know, and he would have people memorize it, you know, go through and try to remember all the words. And what she found was the information that was at the beginning and the information that was at the end, people remembered a larger percentage of than in the middle. You can see how it drops and then goes back up. We see the same thing, like I said, in class. Most of you, when you go to class, you probably remember the beginning pretty well and you remember what you did at the end, but the middle can get a little foggy, right? You don't quite remember the middle all the time. So again, we have this kind of dip, this V or this U, which is the serial position effect. So um, there's two main pieces to this, the recency effect and the primacy effect. The recency effect is there are a uh, tendency to remember the most recent information the best immediately afterwards. So let's say we have class and at the very end of class, as soon as class ends, I give you a test. You're probably going to remember the stuff that I just talked about or just taught you at the very end the best because it's the most recent. Right? You just heard the information, so obviously you're probably going to remember it pretty well. The primacy effect is right here is our tendency to remember the first information presented after a brief delay. So let's say we start class and you know I ask you a question or I give you a, a, a statistic or I give you a vocabulary term at the very beginning of class, one of the first things we talk about. 
at the end of class, if I test you, you're probably still going to remember that first piece as well. So this is that idea. Now, you might be wondering, like, how does this connect with massed practice or distributed practice? Um, and the reason why is this curve is always going to be there. So what we know is that it, the longer we study, the bigger this middle part gets. So for example, if you think about three, if you're studying for three hours, this first chunk is probably only going to be maybe 20 minutes, right? If information is in this primacy, maybe 20 minutes at the end is the recency at most. So that means everything in between those 20 minutes and 20 minutes, right? So, you know, not, uh, so what is it? Two hours and 20 minutes out of your uh, three hours of studying are in this middle part where we're not remembering a huge percentage. So what we can do then is by using distributed practice, by breaking it up, all of a sudden, if this whole uh, curve is only 30 minutes long, well then anything in the middle that I'm not remembering, there's not much in there, right? There's maybe only a few minutes or 10 minutes of information that I'm not remembering as well. Then I take a break and I do it again. So instead of having one really big kind of U, I'm having a bunch of tinier ones that aren't as deep. So again, we're kind of seeing a connection there. We can also have other things that can increase our memory through um, retrieval. So one example is what is called a retrieval cue. So a retrieval cue is just anything that helps you remember a piece of information. So a reminder associated with information that you're trying to get out of your memory. It helps us remember. So this can be things like alarms. This can be things like um, when you're trying to uh, think of the name of something and someone says a similar word or something that sounds similar, right? Those are retrieval cues, things that help you out. If you think about any time you've ever gotten help with something um, or maybe if you're trying to remember someone's name and somebody's trying to help you out, they're giving you retrieval cues. They're giving you things that will hopefully help you get to that piece of information and pull it out. It helps us remember we can also see what is called priming. Now, priming is basically where we have um, associations that will kind of activate uh, information. So basically what the idea is, is by um, cueing you with something, by priming you with a piece of information, with an object, with a phrase, with a song, um, whatever it is, I can prime you. And what I'm doing is I'm kind of like getting your brain rolling. You can think of it like priming an engine um, or priming like a lawnmower if you ever used a lawnmower. Um, and what's happening then is that when that information comes in, it helps our brain more quickly and more efficiently access that information. Priming is a really big thing that we use in teaching all the time. Most of your teachers, although it may be a little different right now why we're um, learning at a distance, but most of your teachers when you're in a class probably start class with some sort of question or some sort of little activity where, you know, you walk in and there's a question on the board and you have to think about it or talk to your neighbors about it or answer it or whatever. That, um, when, when they're doing it correctly at least, is priming. What we're doing is I'm giving you a question to think about. I'm having you think about that question, talk about that question, maybe write an answer down about that. And then what we're going to do in class is we're going to learn about that topic. But what I've done is I've already got your brain thinking about it. I've primed you for the information that you're about to receive, which is going to help you retrieve that information later. It's also actually going to help you remember new information that comes in. So um, retrieval cues prime our memories. So they're actually very much connected here. Priming is um, really the biggest difference is priming is something that we're going to do kind of before we see whatever we're going to do later on. Like before something happens, we're priming it. So for example, I could ask you, what uh, word is this? Well, just like complete that word. If you had that a letter, what would it be? Now, most of us, and, and I've done this in class and kind of taken surveys, most of us are going to add an A here and make this word soap. Now, the, the real word is soup, um, and there's no real reason you would know it's one or the other. But one of the things is, is there's a reason why the majority of us will pick soap. And the reason is, is that on this last slide, I primed you the whole time this slide was up to be thinking about soap, right? I showed you a towel, I showed you a shower, I showed you shampoo and conditioner, 
all things that you would connect with soap, right? Things that you would connect with, with um, soap or with showers and, and kind of that whole group of, of objects. So what I was doing here, and again, I didn't mention any of them. There's not really any reason for these to be on this slide, but to get you thinking about it. So then when you have this question pop up, it's really quick, really easy for our brains to jump to soap. Now, additionally, some of us may have thought of soup, and there's reasons why that may as well, right? It could just be um, maybe you like soup more. Maybe you don't use soap or you don't shower very often. Uh, maybe you're really hungry, right? Maybe if uh, you're watching this and you're about to eat, right, you're thinking about soup because you're hungry. So that can also be a way of, of priming as well that we have. Um, so let me move myself out of the way here. We also have um, what we can call, I guess, our group of dependent memories. So there's three of these that are state dependent, context dependent, on the next slide is mood dependent. And they all function basically the same way, although there's slight differences in each one. So I'm just going to kind of read the definitions and then we'll kind of explain it a little bit deeper. So a state dependent memory is memory retrieval is most efficient when individuals are in the same state of consciousness as they were when the memory was formed. Now, we don't really talk a ton about states of consciousness anymore in AP Psych. Um, we see a little bit of it in that consciousness unit we do over Thanksgiving. But basically, we know that if someone is in the same state of consciousness, it helps them remember something better. All right? It helps them kind of pull those, re retrieve those memories easier than if they're in a different state of consciousness. We see the same thing with context. So context-dependent memories are recall of information while in the same context of environment in which it was inquired. Now, this is another big one that um, we, we use in education um, or that, you know, those of us that know about it do. So, for example, right, uh, if, you, if you're in my class, um, I move people's seats a lot. And for the first semester, generally speaking, um, I just randomly move people's seats around the classroom. And one of the reasons for that has to do with actually context dependent memory. So what we know is basically if you sit in one spot, let's say this is your seat right here. So here's your seat in room 217. There's your seat right there. If you sit in that same seat every single day, you go to class, um, you basically form these memories, but you also have context with them. So when you just walk into my classroom, for example, your brain already is making connections to what we're going to be talking about. It's already taking in the context to do psychology. So if you came in, for example, and for some reason I just gave you a calculus test or a math test, you would probably do worse on that math test than if I gave you the exact same test in your math classroom. Right? If I gave you a uh, AP psychology test in my classroom, you'd do better on it than if I gave that to you in your art room. And that has to do with context-dependent memory. So one of the reasons, like I said, I, I move students around is what I want is I want them to create connections to different places all over the classroom. Right? I don't want you to sit in one seat because eventually if you move that seat, right, all that context is now gone. So I want to kind of spread that out a little bit as we go. Lastly, we have mood. Whoa, oopsie. Lastly, we have mood dependent memory. Now, again, this is going to function the same way. Recall of information that can be retrieved while in a mood similar to when it was acquired. Now, one thing that's important about this is this only works when these are genuine, authentic moods and feelings. So this can't be like, um, you know, I was in a good mood when this happened, so I'm going to try and be in a good mood now to try and remember it doesn't really work like that. These have to be authentic feelings. So when you're actually happy or actually angry um, or actually frustrated or whatever. Now, again, it's going to help us retrieve that information, help us remember it easier. This is one of the reasons why, uh, for example, like if you're, let's say you're really annoyed with your significant other, right? Your boyfriend, girlfriend or whatever, and you're annoyed at them and you kind of get annoyed. They're, they're just being annoying. And then you start thinking and remembering all the other times that they were annoying and all the other times that they, you know, made you mad or whatever. That's an example of mood dependent memory. So you're, you're uh, again, retrieving information that you created, right? Those memories that you stored while you were in the same mood. Same thing goes when you're like really happy. So if you're in a really good mood, 
all of a sudden you start remembering things that were really good, things that happened to you when you were happy, when you're really sad. That's why um, like depression can be one of the reasons depression can be really challenging is when you're when you feel sad, you start thinking and remembering all the other things that made you sad that have happened to you before. Those are all examples of mood dependent memory. So continuing our conversation on ways that we can improve our memory through retrieval, we have what is called the testing effect. So I'm just going to read this definition and then we'll kind of talk about it here. Um, the testing effect is the finding that long-term memory is increased when some of the learning period is devoted to retrieving the to-be-remembered information through testing with proper feedback. And that's a really long definition to basically say practice tests help you learn. So what this means is, let's say uh, we're studying for a test. We're studying for AP Psychology. Now, part of that studying might be going through, and let's say uh, you're reading through your notes, um, or you're reviewing the different things we've done in class, or reviewing a video that you've watched, um, or creating mnemonics, right? Something like that. So you're going through that. You would also gain a lot by taking a chunk of that, instead of spending, let's say, a whole hour doing that, if you spent... 40 minutes doing that and then spent the last 20 minutes doing a practice test. You would actually get more of that. What you're doing is you're literally practicing retrieving that information, right? You're literally practicing going back and pulling that information out of your brain and putting it down on that piece of paper. So practice tests are really, really useful. Um, this is something or a reason why a place like or a site like Quizlet is really useful is they obviously have like flashcards and things like that where you can learn information. But more than that, what they can do is you can test yourself so they can give you questions and it requires you to go back, retrieve that information. And as I get better and better at doing that, it makes me better and better at remembering it. So we never want to just spend this whole study period. If I'm studying, I never want to spend the whole time just reading through notes. Uh, I want to spend at least some of it testing myself in some way. Again, that bottom piece, test your recall using preview questions, take practice tests. This is one reason why they have the, the PPC questions that the College Board creates, um, is to you know get you to do that practice as well as give you an idea of where you're at. The next piece we have is um, not necessarily specifically connected with any of the processes encoding storage or retrieval um, but just has to do with improving our memory in general and what it is is what's called positive transfer so positive transfer is basically the idea where if i have mastered one task or skill so it could be throwing a baseball for example or playing the guitar or um, whatever like there's millions and millions of skills when i master a certain skill that can actually help me learn or perform a different skill. So there's three parts to positive transfer. The first piece is awareness that this new situation is one in which prior knowledge can be used. So basically you have to acknowledge the fact that this other thing I've done or I can do can also be used here. Second thing I have to do is successfully treat, retrieve the prior knowledge. So I have to go back, I have to get that information and pull it out. And the third thing is successfully use the application of prior knowledge to the new situation. Okay, so again, all this stuff a lot of times too will happen very quickly. Um, it might be something like, especially if you're doing something with like athletics or if you're doing something with um, music where these are more, um, I don't want to say unconscious, but more like automatic functions that you're not quite like consciously individually thinking about what to do. Um, you're going to go through these very quickly. But for example, you can see in these images here, we've got um, you know someone throwing a baseball, hitting a volleyball serve, and uh, hitting a tennis ball. And all of them, although they're slightly different, have similar movements, right? They're similar motions. So we can see transfer of a certain skill to this other thing, right? And we see this in a whole bunch of different things. This is why um, like a lot of people encourage people, if you're an athlete, to be multi-sport athletes because one skill from somewhere else can transfer over and help you in this other sport, this other thing you're doing. Same thing works with information in different classes. Same thing goes for art or music um, or any of these other skills that we do. Basically, we master one thing that can help us in other things in our life as well. Our last piece here 
is um, the connection between memory and sleep. And most of it is in this video here uh, that we watched during, we'll watch during class. Um, but we're seeing this connection between these two pieces. So I'm just going to give you the big highlights, which are the bullet points here. Um, the biggest thing is you need to get enough sleep. And this is something that, you know, as, as teenagers especially, we tend to not be very good at. Our sleep schedules tend to be different. You tend to stay up later um, and sleep in longer than, than, you know, like a school schedule will usually allow you to do. So lack of sleep is a really big issue. So we always want to try and get enough sleep. The reason for that is that lack of sleep contributes to a lower ability to concentrate and a lower ability to problem solve. Now, um, those are obviously two really important things when it comes to doing anything, but especially doing school and especially learning new information. In addition, one of the things that happens while we sleep is we consolidate memories. So when you're sleeping, one of the things that's happening is in your brain, your short-term memories, or at least some of them, are being turned into long-term memories. And those neural connections are being made, right? We talk about how there's literal connections that are, that are forming and changing and moving around in our brain as we learn information. So a lot of that is happening while we're sleeping as those different connections are being made, um, those different uh, memories are being shifted from place to place and strengthened or weakened depending on if we're using them. So sleep is really important. When we don't sleep, what happens is that mem those memories don't get consolidated. This is why like, if you stay up for a really, really long period of time, it's kind of hard to remember what's going on you know, as you get more tired, right? You kind of start to forget things. It's harder to focus. It gets really hard to do anything. I'm sure most of you have had that happen before, especially if you like stayed up really late and tried to study. As it gets later and later, right? When you start getting tired, it's harder and harder and harder to do anything. Um, we also know that different memories um, get consolidated better depending on different times before you go to sleep. That sounds a little weird. It's explained a little bit better in the video. Um, but basically, we know that uh, if you do something an hour before you go to sleep, it's really good. Um, so let's say you're studying, right? And then you stop. If you, you know, do something, if you, you know, relax or whatever for an hour and then go to sleep, that actually helps your brain commit that information to memory. It helps it store that better. It has to do with, again, consolidating those memories better. Now, there is a difference between like a procedural memory, which is like doing something physical, like playing an instrument or or a sport and um, more of the like abstract memory, like doing uh, math or reading or um, something that's generally more connected with school. There are a little bit of differences there. Again, they'll address that in the video, but you kind of get the general idea. Now this last page, this last page here is just literally all general tips to um, help you study. So one of the things that um, we can really use from this unit uh, is to get better and more efficient at how we prepare for things. Now, obviously, as AP students, you know, the, the assumption is that you're going to be studying, right? And the reality is you're, you're going to have to on some level to, to, to be successful, at least in this class and, and in most of your AP classes. But one of the things um, I know, you know, from when I was a student and I um, obviously see, you know, as a teacher now is that most of us at the high school level and, and really even at a college level aren't really very efficient or good at studying. A lot of us, again, like I said, we'll sit down and we'll cram for, you know, three, four hours. Um, I know in college, like some people will stay up, you know, for a, a day, a full day or two days or three days or whatever before finals. And you're just trying to cram everything in. And that's really not a very good way to do it. So here are kind of some, hip, uh, some helpful tips for you. So <clears throat> one of the first ones is to minimize distractions. This is really important when it has, to, especially uh, as we connect it to encoding. So for example, you should never study with music on. You should never study with the TV on. You should never study with anything going on around you. Um, this isn't necessarily a bad thing to do, like having playing music or whatever when you're doing something. Um, especially if you're doing something that's kind of like mindless that you don't have to focus super hard on. But when you're studying, it's really bad because you're actually basically splitting that attention, right? We can only focus on one thing at a time. So by having more information coming in, it's restricting my ability to encode the information that I'm trying to learn um, as efficiently as I can. So we want to get rid of everything that's a distraction. Phones are obviously a really big one as well. 
the next thing is we want to study before we sleep, right? Study before we go to sleep. So we often learn things better just before we go to bed because of what's called heightened nocturnal activity. So for example, let's say you have to study. You might actually get more out of waiting, right? Let's say you get done with school at like two o'clock, right? Um, instead of studying right at two o'clock, you might actually get more out of, you know, doing other things during the day. And then, you know, I'm going to go to, let's say you're going to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, maybe from um, like eight to nine, I'm just going to spend one hour and kind of study stuff. That's my study time. That's actually probably going to be more useful. You might get a little bit more out of it because again, having to do with that consolidation of our memories. Um, in addition, we want to have occasional downtime. This is what I was talking about before when we talked about um, breaking up practice, right? Uh, distributed practice. So in this time, we want to, like it says, literally do nothing. So occasional downtime is not I'm watching TV. It's not I'm reading a book. It's like literally nothing. And like it says, turn down the lights, you know, lay down, take 15, 20 minutes and just like sit there. Right. Which it's also good for you mentally and emotionally, but it's also going to help, you know, consolidate those memories and help you get more out of your study. Um, next piece, do not study back to back study times for topics that are likely to interfere with each other. This is a pretty important one, especially as you know, if you're taking like multiple AP classes that you have to study for consistently is I want to break up what I'm doing. So one thing that can be nice is you might be saying, well, you know, Mr. Osi, I can't take 15 or 20 minutes off you know, every 30 minutes of me studying. I don't have time for that. One thing I can do is make sure that you're working on classes that are very different. So let's say you're going to study for AP Psych. Um, and then right after that, make sure you study something like math. That is very different, right? There's almost no crossover between the two. You're not going to get anything confused. What it's going to do is it's going to allow you to switch over a little bit, right? You're going to use a little bit different parts of your brain. You're going to be using different information. And you're not going likely to get information crossed. What would be maybe not the best thing to do is study psychology and then right after it study like sociology, which I don't know if a lot of you know what that is necessarily, but it's the study of groups of people. So we don't want to do those because there's a ton of crossover between the two. They're very similar. And what can happen is that information can get crossed and mixed up. The next piece, um, and this is probably the most important piece, is to make the ideas that you're studying meaningful. You want to uh, have everything you study have a meaning to it. This is why, again, uh, I talked to you guys about the beginning of the year about using Cornell-style notes and having that section where you can add in pieces of information. This is also why I add um, the daily psychology extra credit assignment that I create for you guys because what you're doing when you do those is you're adding real life examples from that you've seen or experienced to the terminology from class. And by doing that, you're making it meaningful. We can talk all day about distributed practice, but if you can, you know, give an example of what that looks like or an example of what masked practice is, and you think about like studying all night and you can picture it in your head, you're going to remember that a lot better. This is uh, really what we're doing is we're you know, having a deeper processing. We're pro using deep processing. And by making that uh, processing deeper, we're going to remember it better. Okay, So we always want to try and make something as meaningful as we possibly can. The last piece is more of a general one, which is to live a mentally active life. So um, just like you, um, our muscles get, we get stronger and our muscles grow as we exercise, so does our brain. It doesn't literally grow, obviously. Well, I mean, it kind of does. It doesn't get bigger, I guess I should say. Um, but by literally using our brain all the time, it actually increases our ability to do these different skills and these different, um, you know, kind of ability to retrieve or, or encode information. So by practicing things, by using our memories, by thinking about things, by problem solving, even if it's just things like games, like games are actually very good for problem solving because they, they ask you to uh, solve puzzles a lot. Um, what we're doing is we're using that, our brain, right? And by using it, it's helping us out. This was actually, uh, this like piece of information is a really big reason why um, people kind of became really freaked out and, and still are. Um, when it comes to technology, because one of the things that's happened is, is that as technology has gotten better and better, it's allowed us to kind of think less and less. So 
for example, let's say you had to remember, um, like a really simple one, like remembering someone's phone number. Uh, nowadays, you, you don't probably, you probably barely know anybody's phone number if you know anyone's, right? Hopefully, you know like your parents' phone number, but most of you might not know anybody else's phone number at all because you just save in your phone. Um, so there were people that, and and I think still are, some even psychologists are nervous that what's happening is is that the less we have to use it the more we kind of like you know use it or lose it like the uh less will it be able to maybe do some of these things in the future and two you guys can see this when you watch those um memory or uh, memory olympics uh competitors they're really this is they are just using certain muscles in their brain right muscles in their brain and they're getting really good at it and that's allowing them to kind of have these really really incredible um, abilities to remember things. Uh, and that last piece is kind of connected, right? Learning a new language, volunteering, and other activities that strain your brain are uh, better bets, are really good for helping you kind of have a healthier brain. All right, so that wraps up um, the this video on uh, improving our memory. Uh, please make sure to do a short summary here, and I'll see you guys next time. Maybe not.